After constant questions over Xi Jinping's whereabouts, he made his first appearance at a major flood disaster site. But netizens are pointing out that an alleged victim he met with appears to be an actress. The CCP is planning to launch a new digital currency that can monitor and track all transactions. We'll take an in-depth look at this. And as WeChat is getting banned in the United States, attention is shifting to its roles in propaganda and censorship and to the ties of its parent company Tencent to the Chinese Communist Party. Hey, also, quick update, we're going to be starting to cover U.S. and world news, at least to an extent. So let us know what you think. For now, we're going to do it in the breaking news section. Again, let me know your feedback. You like it, you don't like it. We'll go from there. Welcome back, everyone. First off, some breaking news. As China is being hit with waves of natural disasters, Xi Jinping, the head of the Chinese Communist Party, has finally made his first appearance at a disaster site. Now, he appeared in Anhui province, which the regime had previously claimed was, quote, sacrificed in order to save other areas from flooding. Now, on August 18th, Xi Jinping appeared for the first time in Anhui for inspections. According to state reports, Xi went in the afternoon to investigate flood control and disaster relief efforts and to see what the situation was. Now, this is the first time, again, that Xi has visited the disaster areas this year. And it's also his first public activity in the past half month. Now, it's believed that this marks the end of the Beidaiha meeting, which is one of the top CCP meetings of the Chinese Communist Party in China. On August 17th, top CCP officials Li Keqiang and Wang Hu Ning also made public appearances as well. And this is also, again, after long disappearances from them from the public eye. And discussions around Xi's visit to Anhui quickly turned to whether the disaster victims he met with were actors. Now, when Xi visited a local resident's house, a woman came out to greet him holding a baby in her arms. Now, netizens pointed out that this, quote, disaster victim looked very similar to Yan Jing, who is the deputy captain of the Funan County Public Security Brigade in Hanhui, and questioned whether the event was faked. Meanwhile, a fire broke out in a shopping mall in Qingyuan city of Guangdong province. Photos show the entire building was completely burned down. Now, at the moment the incident occurred, the mall was open on normal business hours. The cause of the fire is still under investigation. And at the epicenter of the virus in Wuhan, meanwhile, a water park held an electronic music party that drew about 3,000 visitors. Netizens criticized the event noting that people weren't wearing face masks or practicing social distancing, while parts of the country have again been placed under lockdown. One commented, quote, We take precautions even in movie theaters. This is like a group suicide, and it is impossible for them to wanting to die like this all at once. Now, Chinese state media used this event in the CCP's propaganda, saying that while people in Wuhan are, quote, enjoying life, the, quote, foreigners are all sour grapes. In other news, on August 14th, the state-run TV station CCTV unveiled domestically made aerial bombs for the Chinese military. Now, it claimed the satellite-guided bombs are going to be mass-produced and are going to move the People's Liberation Army into the age of precision strikes. Now, this follows the CCP's completion of its new Beidou satellite network, which it's pushing as a replacement for the U.S. GPS system. And these satellite systems, again, can be used for weapons targeting for military purposes. Now, meanwhile, the National Pulse published an exclusive story claiming that a former advisor to New York Governor Andrew Cuomo is registered as a foreign agent to lobby for the Chinese regime. And notes the individual, Daniel Cohns, also served as the communications director for Democrat Congressman Mike Honda and later became vice president at lobbying company BLJ Worldwide. Now, the foreign agent registration document from Cohns is available on the FARA official website. And in some U.S. news, President Trump appears to have given the OK for Oracle to buy Chinese social media app TikTok, which means that Oracle and Microsoft are now very likely going to be bidding for the app. And sanctions and bans on Chinese companies are not expected to end here either. During a recent webinar of the Home Furnishings Association, Washington lawyer Michael Borden claimed that Trump campaign officials told him to expect announcements of punitive actions against China and Chinese companies every three to four days until the election. And the Trump administration is saying there are no new trade talks scheduled between the United States and China. I postponed them. I postponed talks with China. You know why? I don't want to deal with them now. I don't want to deal with them now. With what they did to this country and to the world, I don't want to talk to China right now, okay? And in addition to this, Trump is now promising tax credits 
to companies that bring jobs back from China, similar to what Japan and India are doing as well. And Director of National Intelligence John Ratcliffe also told Fox News that China poses a, quote, greater national security threat to the United States than, quote, any other nation. And also, the U.S. Justice Department has announced that on August 13th, it made the largest ever seizure of cryptocurrency accounts from terrorist organizations, which it said dismantled the financing operations, at least partly, of Al-Qassam Brigade's Hamas's military wing, Al-Qaeda and ISIS. It stated U.S. authorities seized millions of dollars from over 300 cryptocurrency accounts. And in some world news, in Iran, the government is saying its confirmed death toll from the CCP virus has passed 20,000 people. In Africa's Mali, President Kaita was forced to resign after soldiers staged a mutiny. The CCP's foreign ministry spokesperson, Zhao Lijian, responded to this, stating that China, quote, opposes the use of force and other abnormal means to change power. Now, his comments drew questions from commentators, however, who pointed out that the CCP's Marxist theory is, quote, advocating the seizure of power through a violent revolution. You know that the CCP is facing domestic and international challenges, its spokesperson had to change this narrative, fearing very likely that people will overthrow the CCP. And now for the broader stories for today. Now, how would you like it if you no longer had any paper money and your every purchase was tracked by a centralized bank tied to the government. Well, if the CCP's new digital currency takes off, this may be the future of cash. Part of the CCP's solution to the various forms of pressure on its economy right now is to fight a currency war with the United States. And after years of trying and failing to do this, to create its own currency as the number one currency in the world using banknotes, it's now turning to a digital currency. Now, as opposed to other cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum, the digital yuan is a state-backed digital currency. And the CCP's central bank, the People's Bank of China, will be able to record every transaction it's used in allegedly in real time. Now, this is a heavily centralized currency, which sets it apart from the others, and also uses a system similar to blockchain, which has a peer-to-peer -peer payment system in it. Now, the new currency can allegedly work without people needing bank accounts, although everything still goes through the CCP's central bank. As China's NTD host Tong Hao noted, the state-run digital currency gives the CCP a few key strategic tools. Now, since it's digital, it'll allow the CCP to more easily manipulate currency, also the amount of cash available, and then use this to stimulate its economy. In addition, it'll also let the CCP more directly monitor the purchases and daily lives of Chinese citizens, a system it already has to some extent, at least, when it comes to its social credit system. It'll also act as a tool for the regime to monitor and possibly even prevent money from flowing out of China. And capital outflow is something the CCP has been trying to crack down on as well. Now, when it comes to banknotes, a type of cash most of us are familiar with, the Chinese Communist Party has in the past over-distributed the notes to boost its economy. Now, this caused the currency to devalue, and the CCP was also called out for intentionally devaluing its currency. This caused prices to rise and lowered its purchasing power. If the CCP shifted to a digital currency, it would make manipulation of this kind more easy to control and to hide. And it's viewed as a way for the regime also to bring down inflation and to stabilize prices, because again, it controls all the numbers. It's also seen as a reaction to avoid U.S. sanctions. Using the U.S. dollar means that transactions are regulated by SWIFT. And for the CCP, the potential actions against its banks, when it comes to sanctions and so on, is seen as a looming crisis for China. Now, this will also be a way for the CCP to extend its systems of authoritarian control, bringing a currency in all transactions fully under the watchful eye of the Communist Party leadership through its central bank. And using an electronic system will make this a globally available currency immediately. And it will also allow the Chinese Communist Party to more easily finance influence operations, conduct money laundering, and fund its operations overseas the Chinese Communist Party will control the data from all transactions again. Now, what does this mean? What we're seeing here, if this currency goes through, is the end of privacy when it comes to transactions and exchange for services. It's a tool for espionage. The Chinese Communist Party can monitor everything done with it, it can finance operations, and it can use it to collect data on purchases and where that money's going. 
the world is about to see a new level of currency wars. The United States on one side when it comes to, say, hard currency or currency with the, say, banknote system, and the Chinese Communist Party with an e-currency, one that is under authoritarian control by the CCP. And the CCP will also need to compete with other digital currencies, where one of the main draws with them, such as with Bitcoin, is their decentralized structure outside the control of the banking system. They also give relative, say, anonymity when it comes to purchases and where the money is being sent. People who typically go for these different finances, who go for digital currencies, oftentimes do it because they want something outside the control of the banking system. If the CCP makes this new currency, however, this will be one that's open to investment, open for purchases, and so on. But we'll have to see how the U.S. reacts to it as well. Meanwhile, the ban on Chinese social media app WeChat following TikTok has more to it than first meets the eye. Now, some news agencies have been reporting that the ban on WeChat cuts off overseas Chinese from their friends and family back home in China. But what they broadly failed to note is that the Chinese Communist Party blocks numerous U.S. social media platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. But an even less discussed piece of information on this is how the Chinese Communist Party uses it to control information seen by Chinese users. Now this app, again WeChat, blocks content from Chinese language news outlets that report critically on the CCP. This includes the Chinese editions of the Epoch Times, NTD, Voice of America, and Radio Free Asia. And this also means that news being shown on these apps to Chinese users is being filtered and approved by the communist system in China. Now at the same time, the app censors users in line with the CCP's interests. Among the studies done on this was done in 2016 by watchdog group Citizen Lab. It found that users who registered accounts using mainland Chinese phone numbers continued to face censorship even when they traveled abroad. And Citizen Lab also found this again this year, that WeChat monitors overseas users and uses data from this for its censorship algorithms. Now, the ban on WeChat is a major blow to the Chinese Communist Party's ideological control, including through censorship and through news stories it shows to the world. When it comes to the CCP's interests on this, why do they censor the internet? Why do they insist on controlling all the media? Why, do, why is it, for example, that if a government anywhere in the world makes a critical statement of the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party will react in very strong terms immediately? What other country has a system like that? that monitors everything and, say, lashes out at any criticism against its system. For the Chinese Communist Party, the reason they do this is because ideology is their biggest weak point. If the Chinese people can see through the illusions of this, see through the lies and see the information it tries to hide from them, the CCP views that as a threat to its stability. Also, the Chinese Communist Party can use this system to monitor overseas Chinese citizens. When it comes to its interests on this, I've talked before about the United Front, one of the branches of the United Front is the Overseas Chinese Affairs Office, the OCAO. One of its jobs is to monitor Chinese communities. Now, they regard even second and third generation Chinese immigrants as being targets of this system, and they have databases on them. For the Chinese Communist Party having access to this network of people communicating on this platform, if they need it again to communicate with family members, this is something strategically useful for them also in that system. And the issues with WeChat go beyond just monitoring users. Taiwan News reported that the app's system to monitor users outside of China can be used by the CCP to enforce its censorship programs. Now, it reported one example of this. A Chinese user was jailed for sharing content censored in China with a friend who was in the United States. And so what are we seeing here again? The U.S. ban is being accused of cutting off users from friends and family in China. But what if your chats with your friends or family can get them arrested? What if your conversations can get a friend or found member arrested? Is it then safe to use? That is the case with WeChat, and there have been cases showing this. And on top of this, in addition to all this, WeChat's parent company Tencent is deeply tied to the Chinese Communist Party. A photo went viral recently of staff members of that company holding a Communist Party flag in front of a company logo. Taiwan News reports that close to 23% of employees at Tencent are members of the CCP. Now it also notes that all Chinese companies are required to have a staff member in the CCP who hands down edicts within that company from the Communist Party system. And many companies also have a CCP committee as part of the government systems within the businesses. Now note several reports showing that Tencent is no exception to this. 
and Tencent is viewed as a company that, quote, firmly conveys the voice of the party and the government. And for U.S. companies that refuse to follow the CCP's restrictions, meanwhile, its authorities often act quickly and with a heavy hand. The regime recently banned, for example, the text editor Notepad++ after it published a note on an update stating, quote, stand with Hong Kong. And so again, what are we seeing? The CCP exerts heavy control over its own platforms, and it shows its willingness to censor Western tech companies at the drop of a pin. If its own companies get censored for the many, many forms of abuse they have, whether it's human rights abuses, whether it's theft of intellectual property, or whether it's violations of privacy of its users, these can go, say, uncriticized. And if you criticize them, suddenly you're the target of criticism. But at the same time, the CCP does this to Western tech companies. How many, say, social media platforms are allowed to operate in China? Really hardly any. Maybe LinkedIn to some extent, but it's heavily censored. And at the same time, the CCP, again, at the drop of a pin, will censor Western companies or even kick them out of the country for something so minor as making a statement that challenges the interests of the CCP. And meanwhile, the upcoming 2022 Winter Olympics in Beijing are looking to become a spotlight on the regime's human rights abuses. Now, the largest overseas Uyghur organization, the World Uyghur Congress, is urging the International Olympics Committee to reconsider holding the 2022 Winter Games in Beijing. And they're saying this is due to the CCP's abuses of human rights. Now, they stated in a complaint that the committee may be breaching the Olympic Charter by allowing the Olympics to be held in China, despite evidence of genocide and crimes against humanity. Now, the committee responded to this, saying it needed to stay neutral on global political issues and claimed that the Chinese regime will respect the Olympic Charter. Now, a bit of history on this. We saw the same backlash against the CCP ahead of the 2008 Beijing Olympics. And rather than reduce its human rights abuses leading up to that, rather than, say, align with the Olympic Charter, the Chinese Communist Party accelerated its abuses. It arrested critics of the regime. It persecuted the Tibetans at the time who were trying to protest. And it did all of this in addition to building and, say, launching new systems of censorship and information control, including some of its state-run media that began operating overseas around that time. And even then, press was pretty strong against the Chinese Communist Party, but now the global trend against the CCP is even stronger than it was in 2008. The Olympics will likely shine a light on this even further. And so again, while it shows human rights abuses, while the CCP is very likely violating the Olympic Charter, as the World Uyghur Congress is noting, this will also very likely bring attention to the abuses of the Chinese people by the CCP. Another report from China right now says that CCP authorities in the Atush region of Xinjiang, again where the Uyghurs are, have replaced a mosque they destroyed in 2018 with a public toilet. Reports say the CCP has destroyed around 70% of the mosques in Xinjiang. Now, similar to what they do again with Christian and Catholic churches, and its practice of replacing mosques with public toilets is apparently common. Now, going back to 2008, the big point that was raised during the Beijing Olympics was what the games signify if the committee is willing to tolerate the human rights abuses like this, let alone the fact that the CCP used the Olympics as an excuse to increase its abuses. In other words, the Olympics themselves became a linchpin to make the CCP more abusive, not less. But going forward again towards 2022, the Olympics themselves could act as a spotlight. These will bring attention to these issues. Now, with that said, folks, we're again broadcasting five days a week, Monday through Friday. If you want to support this channel also, please join us on Patreon. You can find the link to that in the description below. If you haven't already, please also don't forget to like and subscribe. It really helps this channel grow. And also, if you want to go the extra mile, you can tell a friend or family member about Crossroads. Now, with that said, please take care of yourselves, stay healthy, and stay free. Mm -hmm.